our community increase the number of affordable homes so people who work in Chelsea could also afford to live in Chelsea. Okay, we're in now. Affordable housing. Um, everyone knows that developers put their own price point on their housing. No local unit of government can interfere. So in order to afford housing, for, for, to sponsor affordable housing, we would have to subsidize. And in order to subsidize, we would need to employ a housing authority, which means raising more taxes. And I don't think any of us want that. Thank you. Okay, and next, Christine. Um, yes, I think that uh, af affordable housing is something that um, I think is, a, is currently recently being addressed by city council. Um, the key to affordable housing actually is the getting baked in to your master plan and your zoning ordinances a ro robust description and regulations and permissions for mixed use development. And so um, when I think of affordable housing, I think of mixed use development. How well um, are we aiming at the vision and the ideal of more mixed use development? It, it, this is all comes with a package also of how um, commercial buildings are developed or renovated how parking can become parking for residents in those mixed use developments, how parking can be placed uh, to the back of mixed use developments. And so I, I think the onus really lies on this very, already very exciting collaboration that always goes on between city council and its planning commission and its uh, zoning board, but also with entities like downtown development authority which um, does have input uh, from the point of view of marketing and um, making the notion of mixed use developments um, an appealing feature to uh, the people of Chelsea. So uh, yes, I, although I know the debate on affordable housing has had to do with accessory to homes, I think it's a much more important uh, structural issue that can make the city very exciting and vital and also inclusive, which um, uh, inclusive of all kinds of citizens here in Chelsea. Thank you. And next up is uh, Bill Ruddick. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I'm going to uh, uh, agree entirely with um, Kate on, on, on the uh, idea that it's really through the master plan and the and the zoning that and the variances that are offered through from the city and also there are lots of ways in fact one of the most recent developments that is going to happen is converting an old uh, plant into into apartments which should be somewhat affordable that's all happening with the help of the city so we can leverage that without taking taxpayer dollars uh, so I very much feel that we need in this community the ability for the people who work and support us in our restaurants, at the Jiffy Mix plant, they need to live here. They need to be part of our community. They don't need to be driving, you know, from, you know, 15 to 100 miles away because that's where they can afford a house. Uh, and, and that's what, would, what I would be very supportive of. Um, and I agree also with, with, with Kate in the idea that uh, the, the DDA, I think, can play a role in helping us make that happen. They're the ones that are struggling right now. We have downtown businesses closing at two because they can't get people living close enough that can work for them. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. And next is Phil. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. When I think of affordable housing, I think of two categories. Number one, what it costs builders to build houses. The cost of land is not going down. The cost of materials is skyrocketing and builders have to make a living. They have to make a profit. Based on that, our ability to create affordable housing is somewhat limited. The only alternative to what builders have to pay and what they have to earn is intervention of government. Intervention of government can take a lot of different, um, it can be achieved in a couple of different ways. Number one, it can be tax breaks or it can be subsidizing the housing. As mentioned, I don't think anybody wants to cut into the tax base, nor do they want to increase our taxes. So the market for housing is going to be what it is. It's going to be the cost of housing plus profit equals the price point. Thank you. And finally, on this question, Stephen Wright. With the recent uh, zoning ordinance um, uh, review and modifications, there have been some opportunities presented uh, with regards to um, attempts to provide uh, more affordable housing within the city. I refer specifically to the uh, situation where on um, individual lots, the ability to add some accessory housing um, is um, has been um, made available through the changes in the zoning ordinance. Um, some people think that uh, that didn't go far enough, and um, there's reason to say that maybe it ought to be looked at again. But um, there are uh, certainly uh, opportunities that can be provided within the framework of things that the city uh, can do to provide some more housing opportunities to, uh, to the city that would fall in the range of affordable. Um, I'll, I'll stop at that point. Thanks. Hey, thanks. And Tony, I almost forgot you, but I didn't. <laughs> so you finish up on that question. Thank you. Yes, uh, affordable housing is a uh, is an ongoing topic, not just in Chelsea. It's nationwide. Um, there's a housing, there's a, a shortage of affordable housing all over the place, uh, and in communities like Chelsea, which are highly desirable places to live, naturally, because of that, because it's a highly desirable place, inventories are low. Therefore, supply and demand pushes your prices up. Uh, what we've done as council is. Uh, is attack this problem because it's been ongoing. Um, we created a housing committee uh, that uh, did some surveying and collected some data about housing uh, to uh, ensure that, to prove the fact that Chelsea is uh, not necessarily affordable for those that work here, uh, which is in some ways unfair. The people that uh, work here to help build this community and make it great and love it just as much as we do can't live here because they aren't, uh, they don't earn enough to actually afford it. Um, one of the things that we've done with as council is work together with developers um, as they are uh, presenting us with plans. Um, the, for example, the, the, um, the renovation of the Rockwell building that's currently uh, going to get underway soon. Uh, converting that into apartments instead of uh, $500,000 luxury condos is one of those steps where city has worked with the developers. Uh, the Wolf development on, on Freer and the old US-12, uh, looking at their mixed use of having both uh, small as well as large houses. So we have a mixture and diversity of housing within the city limits. I think that's what one of the things that we need to, to work on, and I think we can do without having to subsidize it. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Okay, we're moving on to the next question, and uh, Christine will answer this one first. What experience do you have with formulating and implementing policies? I have I have a a good good 
well of experience formulating and implementing policies. I'm gonna go back to my career at Eastern Michigan University. Um, been there, still is there for 32 years. Um, 30, you know, uh, about 40% of my career at Eastern Michigan University has been in administrative positions, um, both as department head, also uh, serving the president and the provost on commissions that have to do with human rights and uh, sexual violence assault. Um, and also as associate dean of the largest college on the entire campus, the College of Arts and Sciences, where I was part of a team uh, implementing and, and writing and developing policies that had that governed um, that governed uh, budget and governed um, policies related to students and faculty. Externally to that, um, of course, I've served on the um, Dexter Township Planning Commission, and I'm currently, which um, we worked uh, pretty hard to completely rewrite the bylaws for the commission and to rewrite in those bylaws, our relationship to the Dexter supervisors. So um, I, I like policy there, it's a guideline. Um, policies and procedures are ways in which we um, conduct a democratic and civil environment uh, between govern governance and citizens and, and civic organizations as well. Um, so that's what I can think of right now in the time I have left. Thank you very much. And next up on that question is Bill Ruddick. And uh, just to clarify, is what is uh, our each of our experience relative to policy creation? Is that yeah, right? Formulating and implementing policies. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, and uh, I have uh, I'm in the middle of a, a rewriting a policy right now with the church that I work for, uh, at Chelsea First United Methodist Church. I I can't go into any of the details of that but I do it all the time. Uh, the, uh, I have been involved in policy writing for churches, well, personnel, uh, policy writing for the financial administration, how it's going to be managed and who's going to have what checks and balances and controls. So I'm very familiar with, with writing policy and implementing it. Um, I will say it's a good question because that's what, the council does. It sets the policies under which the, the, the city will operate. Uh, we need to use policy, though, as a way of guiding our government to do what we want it to do, as opposed to we're setting up policy to prevent this and prevent that, and prevent, which is okay, that needs to be done, but we want to have policy be the implementation of our vision versus roadblocks to getting there. And if we have policy that is a roadblock, we should address it and change it. Um, and uh, with that, I'll, I'll let, it, let it go. Thank you. Thank you. And next up is Phil. Thank you. Like I said in my opening, my entire career was spent as a cop on the street working in uniform, working with the public. I had no role in formulating policy. However, any police department relies on the cop on the street to implement the policies that come from above. So my entire career was spent implementing policies that were created by others to the best of my ability and trying to make them into a practical practice that could be, that could take place on the street and uh, convince the public to go along. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Stephen, same question. Yes, um, there's a, several different things that I could point to. Um, probably um, the one most significant one outside of my university activities <clears throat> involves the time that I spent on the Huron River Watershed Council. Um, I was a member of the uh, Huron River Watershed Council uh, since 1979, first as a representative for Washtenaw County, 
and then ultimately after the city of Chelsea joined, then I became a representative for the city and I'm currently serve in that position. I've been on the executive committee of the Watershed Council most of the years between 1979 and the present time. In one of the really interesting policy decisions that we faced was in the early 90s where um, a decision had to be made about whether we're going to go big or go home. In other words, um, we want to get more funding uh, through grants and other uh, um, external funding and uh, hire the people to support those activities. Uh, that was the route taken and it was successfully implemented. At the university, I was a member of the leadership team at the Graham um, Environmental Sustainability Institute uh, in the early stages of its uh, life, and uh, we had to develop all the policy that basically dictated educational efforts, outreach efforts, and other activities associated with that. I could mention a number of other things, but I think I'm about out of time here, so I'll go ahead and stop. Thank you, Stephen. And next up is Tony. Thank you. Um, mo most of my experience actually in terms of policy has been um, with uh, reviewing policy and uh, interpreting policy. Oftentimes these are uh, policies are have been written uh, uh, some time in the past and sometimes don't always apply to current situations. And uh, so it's important to review policy. Um, naturally on city council, our guiding policy is our city chart. And it is important for every member of council to review that and understand it. And if there's something in there that they don't understand to question that and, and get a better understanding of it. Um, formulating policy, we're always changing, you know, things are changes, things change, new policies need to be written for those changes. That's what city council does, but we do it collaboratively and working together. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tony. And then finally on that question, David. Okay, honestly, I am not really worked with any policy creating. Uh, I have worked with families and kids while coaching and set up, you know, game plans and things like that. But um, policy has a lot to do with common sense and listening to people and what people want and then setting up the policies needed and implementing them as needed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna do uh, one more question here. And since we got started a little bit late, I'm hoping, uh, John, we can run over maybe till eight or 10 after and get this done. So that's what I'm shooting for here. So the next question is, and we'll be starting with Bill on this one. Um, so it's a statement and then a question, I guess. There are strong opinions and desires among Chelsea residents. How will you help guide and ensure the council stays focused on the community and the city of Chelsea itself, rather than become overcome with national political narratives? And we'll start with uh, Bill. You know, I, I think that, uh, I, I, first of all, being a council, I would really, expect the rest of the council to listen to and let all of us listen to the community and you know if a community member comes in and is uncivil they're trying to get something off their chest that's okay what we have to be on council is modeling the that that we heard this person we don't like the delivery but we heard them and we're going to and we're going to take that into consideration on how we formulate a solution but again, um, we model that by our dialogue. And I would also look to the, you know, whoever the mayor is to make sure 
that the council has adequate time to discuss issues and the focus of our issues should be how do we address the concerns of our citizens and um, we do have recently issues that are of a national nature that have been hitting our school district uh, I think that the board is doing a very good job of trying to address those uh, concerns, but we just really just need to uh, listen, do what's right for the community, and, and, and act like the leaders that we're meant to be, as opposed to, um, you know, angry citizens. I guess that's all I can say in terms of uh, how I would do it. Thanks, Thanks Bill. Uh, next up is Phil. Thank you. I've always believed that government was intended to be a neutral body whose function was to deliver services. My belief is that people shouldn't even know what the personal views are of the people on council, that the, the, their only purpose is to deliver the services that are identified by the citizens in the community. Thank you. Hey, thank you. And uh, next up is Stephen. Hopefully uh, we as a council are able to talk to each other and resolve our internal differences. We also will need to remember that um, people who are requesting things of the council don't always know what the council can and cannot do. And so that there are always constraints on the kinds of things that can actually be delivered. Um, we um, uh, need to, um, whenever we get in that kind of situation, uh, remain uh, respectful of the uh, uh, people who make the request, but understand that um, there are limits and try and communicate uh, that information uh, directly to them. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And Tony, you're up next. I think it's absolutely imperative that uh, city council members should be focused on the needs of their community. Uh, it's that community that votes for us. It's that community that chooses who they want to represent them in the city government to make the decisions that will affect them ultimately as residents of the city. Um, just focus on that. I think it's important to listen to the community. Because after all, that's who we work for. I don't do this job as, a, as, as you know, for notoriety or certainly not for money. It's because I feel I want to give something back to the community that I that I love living in so much, and that's I believe I believe everybody that's here tonight feels that same way. Um, it is driven by the community, and it is what our campus needs to be representing the people of Chelsea. Thank you, Tony. And uh, next up is David. I'm working the bugs out of this Zoom thing. <laughs> You're doing great. <laughs> um, I will go into this position knowing that not everyone will agree with all of my decisions. But I believe my decisions will be made to keep our city safe for our citizens and desirable for those visiting our city. I believe we all need to listen, think before we speak, and respect others' opinions in order to carry on a civil conversation in the hope that it would result in an outcome that everyone can agree with. I will use independent and objective judgment in my decision making. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, uh, Christine. Yes, uh, this question asks us to think about guiding a focus on community rather than being overcome by national and political narratives. 
Um, I'm a professor of philosophy and women's and gender studies, and I teach about social justice theory, and I teach about speech. And what does speech mean? We live in a free speech society. I work in a free speech institution at the university. Free speech encompasses not only civility, but also open dialogue, and um, also um, ethical, ethical norms that guide free speech. I really like our ethical principles that are posted on our website, on the city uh, website for the government of the city of Chelsea. These ethical principles are, if we adhere to them as city council members, will indeed protect us from any harm that might come from speech that's national or political in origin. But I do think that speech needs to be respected and heard. Debate is also civil. Um, hearing different op opinions and listening to them is part of our open meetings commitments. So um, in that regard, um, I am, I am wary of speech that demonstrates um, possible actions that would violate our non-discrimination ordinance, which is a very strong uh, inclusive non-discrimination ordinance that would involve uh, discriminatory speech toward groups that are protected by our, by our non-discrimination ordinance. And so I think that free speech can become, um, can either be censored or it can be used in a hateful way and I think that city council members uh, take an oath to prevent speech from being uh, geared down, down those destructive things that are destructive of our community. We protect our community through free speech, civil speech, and non-discrimination. Thanks. Thank you so much. And now we'd like to move on to closing statements. Um, because we have so many great candidates running for these three positions, and we only planned about an hour for this, we're going to cut the closing statements to uh, just one minute apiece. But I would like to hear you focus on pretty clearly why it is that you're running for uh, city council. And we're going to start with Phil. And you've got one minute. Thank you. I'd be honored to be able to use my time and talents to serve the public again in a different capacity. My function on council would be to restore a balance that I believe has become dominated by a particular point of view. Thank you. Okay, and next, Stephen. Yes, I mentioned in my introduction uh, some of my experience and uh, professionally and so on, and that is something that I think I can uh, bring to the council in a productive way, but that's not really the reason why I decided to run for city council at this point in time. Uh, my decision was basically driven by some of the concerns that have been expressed in both sessions here tonight, where uh, national politics and the polarization that has been exhibited has uh, made uh, a situation that leaves me concerned anyway. And I decided to run to try and do something about that in a sense of um, interjecting my abilities to try and uh, resolve those issues. Thank you very much. And Tony. Thank you, Paul, uh, and chamber and candidates and community for uh, being here tonight, listening to us uh, and uh, helping. Uh, hopefully, your this helps you uh, get closer to making your decision. Um, I wanted to run for council because I wanted to give back to the community that I felt had given me so much. And I want to continue to stay on council to continue that work. Uh, to keep this great community moving forward, uh, seeing some of the things that we've accomplished in my time on council uh, have been have been excellent. Uh, we are uh, hopefully coming out of this COVID nineteen pandemic without seeing any businesses downtown get shuttered as a result of it. That's remarkable. That is not something that is that too many other towns can say. That is something that this community did as it came together and supported our local businesses during that time of crisis. That's just one example of what makes this community so great and something I'm so proud to be a part of and hopefully that uh, the voters let me uh, be part of again. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. And next up, David. Um, 
You're good. Okay. Um, I'm running for city council because I love this city. I love this whole community. I've lived here all my life and I've seen so much go on here and the people are great and there's so much to do here. The school system, um, my, my kids thrived in it and I just, I just love this town and I want to give back to it. And it's just a passion of mine since I've, since I've been here all my life and I would really like to help out in any way I can. Thank you. Thank you, and Christine? Yes, well, first of all, um, the, the some of the most important catalysts for me running for city council is that um, when I, my own skills are very fitted to city council, they're holistic, and they can contribute to an equitable and inclusive environment. But my own motivation for running for city council is that I like Chelsea, but I want my city council to represent diversity in some fashion as an ideal. And I think that my running for city council, given my, um, my status as an educator and a teacher um, in terms of civil rights and uh, uh, inclusiveness, as well as my uh, work as public servant and the extra training I've received in that regard, and being a woman and being um, a member of various intersecting uh, marginalized groups that are outlined by the non-discrimination ordinance, which is a very, very uh, rich scope of coverage. I think that you will have a more representative city council of your citizens if I'm on the city council. So thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. And finally, Bill. I uh, uh, just want to say uh, one thing um, about again, why I'm running. And that is because I love Chelsea. I will put one of the corollaries to that is that I feel that I can work with people my entire career. I didn't accomplish anything by myself. It was always done by working with people. To listen to the city, to listen to our citizens, to dream about what our future should look like, and to put policies in place to make those dreams come true. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. So we got through this, and I think it was really great to hear all of your answers, very thoughtful and very caring about the community that we live in. I'd like to thank all of the candidates for be willing to do this tonight, and, and moreover, to be willing to actually give your time. If you're elected to this position, it's a lot of work for almost no pay. <laughs> I, mean, I'm, I admire all of you for it. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the people who uh, took your time to log in tonight in this Zoom meeting. I know we ran over a little bit. I try not to flatten my jaw much, too, much longer here, but I have a final thought for you. It is the good fortune of everyone here that we live in a free society where each adult citizen has the right, and I personally would say a duty, to participate in our democratic processes. Please consider everything you've seen and heard here this evening. Find other sources of news about these candidates and what these positions are about. And I urge you to vote for the candidates of your choice on election day. Good evening, and I hope you all stay safe and take care of those around you. Thank you very much for your time. The recording has